I mean, she had to do a lot of research to find the appropriate pictures for the dialogue. But not only accumulating the pictures, but she wrote all of the script that our cast are going to be reading today. And that was not done overnight either. So I think we really have to recognize Janine Munsterman. <laughs> Madison, Minnesota, the county seat of La Caparral County. Eddie Robinson, Boy. Kathy Primo, Boy. Stan Olson, Madison. Merle Munsterman, Madison. Dean Dolman, Bellingham, Minnesota. Christy Werpe, Madison. Bob Lawson, Madison. Fred Eckhart, Boyd Historian. Jerry Ostras, Madison, Minnesota. Alice Sherb, Lewisburg. Peggy Crosby, Dawson. Al Anderson, Madison. Dave Peterson, Dawson. Karen Tilbury, Marietta, and NASA. Sherilyn Bates, Dawson. Doug Bates, Dawson. Linda Anderson, Madison. I, along with these people, will be telling a story of La Caparral County. So let's get started. Obviously, the history of the area that became La Caparral County did not begin just 150 years ago. It had inhabitants as far back as 9,000 to 12,000 BC. The Dakota people, mostly of the Wapaton Band, about 400 people, arrived around the 1600s. They settled in the La Caparral area, moving their villages with the seasons farming, hunting, and fishing. They grew corn, squash, and beans, and made maple sugar and syrup. Fur traders like Joseph Renville and missionaries like Thomas Smith Williamson came later here. In the 1830s, missionaries started the Dakota Mission, which was the first church among the Dakota people in the upper Midwest. The missionary by the name of Stephen Riggs translated the Bible into the Dakota language and developed a grammar book and dictionary in the Dakota language. There is also a Dakota hymn called La Caparral. treaties were entered into with various tribes to obtain land for settlers. The tribes were promised goods, services, cash payments, and lands reserved for them. 
Much of the land encompassing Lacopar County was sold to the United States in one such treaty. The lands were put up for sale, often to land speculators, which led to a large influx of settlers who clear-cut any timber available in order to build homes. They plowed up the land for crops and drove away game. The goods, services, and cash payments promised to the tribes often did not come. This failure was one of the reasons for the uprising of 1862. One piece of Lacoparle history to note, the only white person in Lacoparle County killed during the conflict was Amos Huggins, a missionary and teacher to the Dakota. The conflict itself led to a narrowing of the reservation land with some of it being in what is now Lacoparle County. Note the reservation line on the map more and more settlers began coming to the area. Let's meet one of those early settlers, Frank Stay. Thank you for inviting me. My name is Francois Chate. It's French. Have you ever had your name mispronounced? Well, that happened to me a lot. Somehow when I said Chate, people heard Stay, so they automatically became, my name was Frank Stay. I was an adventurous young man when I came to the United States from Canada at the age of 17. I moved around a lot. In 1862, I farmed in southwestern Minnesota. During the 1862 uprising, Chief Red Dog, who I knew very well, came and warned me that the Indians were coming. I hid in the woods. Surviving the uprising, I eventually joined the Army under General Henry Sibley and was at Camp Release when the Dakota released their hostages, a total of 285 people. I didn't know it then, but one of those released later became my wife. Frank Stay remained for several more years in the Army, serving in various areas in the Western United States, but returned to Camp Release in 1868 to Homestead. <coughs> there he bought 167 acres at $1.25 per acre. He became one of the first permanent settlers in what would become Lacoparo County. When another soldier who I served with in the Army, Joseph Sharon, who had settled in Missouri, became ill and he wanted to return to his homeland in Canada, his wife and five children stayed at my home in Camp Release on their way north. Joseph was too ill to continue on and died at my home. Later, I married his widow, Cecilia, and we had another five children. Early settlers in Lacroparo County had the challenging task of breaking the sod. It was hard work. The roots of the grasses may run deep and the old grass would pile up on the soil. Plowing through those grasses was a challenge. These settlers worked hard over the years and eventually carried out some good lives. The territory that was become Lacroparo County had been part of different Minnesota counties, including Dakota County, then Blue Earth County, then Brown County, and Redwood County. Finally, on March 6, 1871, the Minnesota Legislature authorized the formation of Lacoparle County. Lacoparle is French and is translation of a native Dakota name, Talking Waters. The rapids in the river would make sounds as the waves bounced off the rocks as if someone was speaking. Once the legislature made its decision to form Lacoparle County, it was up to the citizens of the county to form a government and determine a county seat. Meet our next guest, Browning Nichols, who helped establish a settlement in the years leading up to the county's formation. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Browning Nichols, entrepreneur extraordinaire. I'm one of the founders of Lacopara Village. My wife and I, with five other couples, own this fair town. Not to boast or anything, but I was one of the first Count commissioners elected to organize Lacroix County, along with Colbert A. Anderson and Frederick Ehlers. It is because of the three of us that the county seat was situated in Lacroix Village instead of nearby Williamsburg, originally known as Bison City. A few years before in the area, a fellow by the name of William Mills had settled in this area around 1864. At the time he settled here, his nearest neighbor was 30 miles in one direction and 15 miles in another. 
He decided to start a town on his property, which, of course, he named for himself, Williamsburg. He didn't remain the only settlers for very long. In 1869, a group of settlers, led by Peter F. Jacobson, called the Jacobson Group, moved to the Lacoparle area from Fayetteville, Iowa. They came with 42 people and settled around the area of the Minnesota River. These settlers had discussions about establishing a church and a town. But where to locate it? Should it be north or south of the Minnesota River? A church was organized in 1870. It was the first church in the upper Minnesota River Valley. William Mills and others agreed to donate land for a town, a church, and a cemetery. It was planned that this town would be the county seat. By then, Williamsburg had one store. Some settlers located about three miles away from Mil Williamsburg, they wanted their village in that area, and they would call it Lacquaparo Village. They wanted it, not Williamsburg, to be the county seat. Once Lacquaparo County had been organized by the Minnesota State Legislature, three commissioners were elected to set up the county government. All of them, including Browning Nichols, were from Lacquaparo Village, so of course, that became the official county seat. The one store that was in Williamsburg moved to Lacquaparo Village and Williamsburg ceased to exist. There were six couples who owned Lacquaparo Village. The proprietors of our little community at the time were not at all interested in community development. They were more concerned with protecting their investment. One of those couples was Henry Cross and his wife. Not much is known about Mr. Cross, other than he had a reputation for profiting from the citizens of Lacaparl, at least according to the Lacaparl Press, the county's first newspaper. Good afternoon, Mr. Cross. My wife needs 10 pounds of flour and I need a pound of nails. That'll be $5. What? That's robbery. Flour is worth about four cents a pound and nails are a few cents a pound. How can you charge us five dollars? Do you see any other stores? Go somewhere else if you don't like my prices. <laughs> the nearest flour mill is Redwood Falls. Oh, I think I shall faint, my dear. I can't bear it. Whatever shall we do? I remember the high prices at the store. Folks, let me introduce you to Charles J. Colburn, a publisher and editor of the Lacopara Press. Thank you, Nichols. I had the honor of starting the first newspaper in Lacopara County. I disagreed with a lot of Henry Cross's tactics. He started the first business in Lacopara County, a general store, but he had no competition. I actually published a plea in my newspaper on June 11th, 1873 asking for competition. I wrote, I was disappointed in the business part of the town, knowing the character of some of the proprietors. Business makes a town, and competition makes a lively business. There is, at present, one store in the village. In charging such enormous profits on all kinds of goods, they drive away fully one half of the trade that would naturally center here. Will some liberal, far-minded merchant who wants to find a good opening come to the rescue of our county and the fair name of our little town. Remember the horrible blizzard in January of 1873? In addition to financial challenge, weather posed a hardship in winter and summer. Henry Cross and a fellow by the name of James D. Marshall and two other men got caught in that blizzard of 1873. There are two different versions of what happened to them. One story is that they survived two days and two nights buried in a snowbank along the river between Lacaparle and Benson. The temperature had dropped to minus 12 degrees. Marshall went for help and froze his feet. The other version is that they sought refuge in a haystack. They buried themselves in the hay, but Marshall's feet were sticking out and that's how he froze his feet. When the blizzard subsided, they were only a few yards from a hole. 
No one is quite sure which story is correct, but in both stories, Marshall's feet, sadly, had to be amputated. Laquaparo Village seemed on the path to grow into a large community with a mercantile store, general store, farm implement business, meat market, a grain storage, hotel, hardware store, drug store, school, newspaper, an attorney, a bank, and many other businesses. But that all changed in 1884 with the arrival of the railroad. The railroads built along routes they thought would maximize trade, and they bought the right-of-ways to include land for towns. Unfortunately, those routes did not include going through Laquaparo Billy. I heard the railroad is coming to, to this area. That would, for, will be a boom for our county. But not necessarily for Laquaparo Village. I've heard it's going to go farther south.